always seen what they want to see in those splendid red rock canyons and spires of eastern Utah. The ancient Anasazi saw a homeland carved by the hands of divine artisans, while Captain John Maycomb, exploring the area in 1859 for the U.S. Army Corps of Topographical Engineers, reported back that perhaps no portion of the Earth's surface is more irredeemably sterile, more hopelessly lost to human habitation. For the writer Edward Abbey, the red dust and the burnt pits and the lonely sky, all that which lies beyond the end of the roads, was, simply, the most beautiful place on earth. Charlie Steen saw money, government greenbacks and a lot of them, buried in radioactive deposits somewhere under the layer of chocolate-colored wingate sandstone that is the fossilized remains of Jurassic Age desert dunes. The lanky Texas geologist, who had spent his early years prospecting for oil in South America, just knew that uranium was hidden where nobody was looking, deep in the same kind of anticlinal or arch-like formations that yielded oil. And in 1950, uranium was going to be the new oil, the Atomic Energy Commission paying out lavishly to those who helped mine a domestic supply. Steen's hunch promised to make him an overnight millionaire. But first he had to find his seam of the soft greenish yellow rock, the atomically buzzing carnitite ore that the Localuta and Navajo Indians had ground up for war paint. We thought the new Chevrolet Colorado ZR2, a dedicated off-roader conceived with trophy track and quad ATV styling cues and coming across as a Raptor light, would prove to be the right ride to trace Steen's 67-year-old trail through the Utah labyrinths. To make things more interesting, we procured a $47,730 the four-door crew cab fitted with the available 2.8-liter inline Ford Duramax turbo diesel, believing the prodigious 369 pound-feet of Tavor combined with the 20-mile-per-gallon EPA-rated average would produce the perfect uranium prospector. And we were right, with a few caveats. By all accounts. Steen was an extrovert and a bit of a loud mouth. After talking his way out the door of his Texas oil company job in 1950, he packed up his wife, Minnie Lee, she preferred them out, and their four boys and bolted for the Colorado Plateau, lured by a mining journal's report on uranium possibilities in the Four Corners area. He couldn't afford the essential uranium prospector's tool, a Geiger counter. So he placed his faith in his geology training and experience. We picked up our graphite metallic ZR2 in Grand Junction, Colorado, and headed overland, west toward Utah. Besides its lockable front and rear differentials, the ZR2's headline upgrade is its exotic blue and gum automatic aluminum bodied, remote reservoir shocks. They use a spool valve design, basically a cup with a spring-loaded plunger in it that uncovers purposefully shaped belief windows that permit the oil to pass. The deceptively simple design allows very precise bump and rebound tuning. The 4,975-pound truck, as heavy as it is, thus floats over washboards at 45 miles per hour and sponges up the sudden jolts from the mini canyons cut into the trail by runoff. You can cover territory at speeds that would have stunned Steen as he rattled along in his dusty, dilapidated, third-hand jeep, prowling the tablelands and sloth canyons for geologic formations that spoke to him. There was little money that first season of prospecting, so Steen set up the family in a rent-free squatter camp consisting of a small travel trailer and an 8 by 16 foot shack. Likewise, we noticed that the ZR2's interior has rather shallow door pockets and no great places to park camping clutter. It's the downside to buying a less than full-size pickup, perhaps, but the limited space could be used better. Situated at a jaunty angle on the $615 bed-mounted carrier, for example, the Baja-style spare looks tough but is a ridiculous waster of acreage. You can't load anything on the tire and only small items squeeze under or around it. Luckily the rack seems to unbolt easily, though no fixtures are supplied underneath to hang the spare in its normal place. After provisioning up in Moab, we headed to Wendy Yellow Cat Flat, damp and buggy from the spring runoff. Here, ML and the kids had spent the brisk winter of 1950-51 while Steen burned up the meager budget on drilling equipment and supplies. Our dust plume heading west from State Route 128, 
We skirted Arches National Park to the south and wove among the low, scrubby bluffs and crumbling cliffs of broken, rust-colored sandstone to a region nicknamed the Poison Strip. A few long abandoned uranium shafts here were only recently sealed up and fenced off by Utah's abandoned mine reclamation program, which strives to keep paying tourists alive by not losing them to cadence and noxious get the ZR2 is a handler both off-road and on, with tight steering and excellent body control. The big 31-inch Gunier Wrangler to attract knobbies makes surprisingly little noise on pavement while proving to be bare claws in the dust, the sidewalls resistant to scrapping from rock ledges. Compared with the standard Colorado, the ZR2's ride height is 2 inches higher and the track gets shoved out 3.5 inches, endowing the pickup with balletic stability on the slick rock and crumbled schist. A dial gives you the choice of rear drive, auto all-wheel drive, permanent, for high, and for low. Leave it in auto and you may never touch the control again, except maybe to engage the specific off-road throttle, transmission mode that makes it simpler to ease the ZR2 over obstacles. Our tent pitched at Yellow Cat, a jeweled black blanket finally dulsed the long twilight, the Milky Way a glistening vapor stretching from horizon to horizon. You can imagine the four Steen boys scampering in the brush as ML puffed on one of her self-rolled boulder ramps and her husband figured out how to pay for yet another broken coring drill. Out of cash, Steen reluctantly abandoned grubs taking to work as a carpenter in Tucson, Arizona, for a year, but the uranium called to him. Eventually he was able to scrape together enough to return to a promising spot in the Big Indian Wash on the western side of Lisbon Valley, about 30 miles south of Moab. Some uranium had been discovered in this shallow canyon, but it was low quality and the government considered the area right off. Standing on an opposite slope at Big Indian, Steen must have read the clearly visible layers of Wingate and Chalky Chinel sediments like an archaeologist reads an ancient text. The earth was whispering, and he gambled his remaining dimes on drilling core samples at a site he called Me Viva, or My Life, a reference to his old prospecting days in South America. When the drill bit broke off yet again, Steen gathered his few samples and dejectedly started the 100-mile drive back to Cisco, Utah, where ML and the kids were set up in a tar paper hovel renting for $15 a month. At Buddy Counter's gas station in Cisco, the proprietor offered to give Steen's samples a pass with his Geiger counter. When Counter waved it over one of the black rocks, the needle pegged, Steen hadn't recognized the core as pitch blend, an even purer form of uraninite that early gold prospectors despised because it gummed up their equipment. He took off running toward the family shack, blindly knocking ML's loaded clothesline into the dirt while whooping, we found it. It's a million dollar lick. It was July 1952. Steen was 32, and Tiny Moab was about to be swamped with prospectors. We bounced our way up Big Indian Wash, the ZR2's stiff frame soaking up the rocks that have tumbled downhill through the years and the massive potholes that have opened up in the largely forgotten Steen's Road. The ZR2's quietly clattering diesel, $3,500 more than the gas V6, is a perfect tool for this work, the tugboat to work easily moving the truck's bulk up and over all that it encounters once the boost has built. It's only out on the highway that the 2.8-liter feels flat, the accelerator pedal needing to be pegged to make even a leisurely pass. Our Fox verified the diesel's casual approach to speed, reporting times of 9.1 seconds to 60 miles per hour and 16.9 seconds through the quarter mile. But our 20 mile per gallon fuel economy over high terrain and against strong headwinds offers some compensation. Coming around a bend in Big Indian, we spotted a rectangular hole in the primordial clay chin layer framed by aging timbers. A derelict electric train on rails snaked out of the darkness as if hauling another load to the ore hopper. We picked our way down to the weedy site on an even rougher track, finally finding a bowl that the ZR2 couldn't subdue without scraping the protective rocker rails that are part of the package. Written in faded paint on the side of the train, Utex Exploration CO. It was the name Steen devised by merging the words Utah and Texas. We had found me Vida. The million dollar lick turned out to be a $130 million lick, 
the mind rocketing both Steen and Moab to international fame. Breathless news stories told of Steen's lavish new home on a hilltop overlooking the Moab, of his battered and hold boots that he had gilded in bronze, to remind me, in case I forget, how easy it is to earn a million bucks, he said, of the parties that he threw at the Moab airport with more than 8,000 guests, of the plane he flew weekly to Salt Lake City for rumble lessons. Teachers, accountants, mechanics, and dreamers dropped everything and headed for Moab, hoping to become the next uranium air and swamping the tiny town. The April 1955 issue of Motor Life ran a six-page feature by future car and driver editor Griff Borgeson, titled Uranium Prospecting in Your Car. Besides a Geiger counter, Borgeson recommended carrying binoculars, an axe, and a pistol. Mining at Mevita lasted just 12 years, until atomic power lost its luster and the government declared it had enough uranium. Steen was bankrupt by 1968, having lost his fortune to bad investments and a long IRS battle. Others were cleaned out by uranium penny stock swindles and rampant speculation. The miners who died of radiation poisoning paid the heaviest price, however, and the desert was transformed from a pristine wilderness to an industrialized dump crisscrossed by thousands of miles of hastily bulldozed roads. The jeepers and mountain bikers have happily taken over where the ore trucks left off. Compared with all working trucks, the compact, expensive, and heavy ZR2 is a plaything, but it shrugged off everything we threw at it and took us where we wanted to go, back to those heady days in 1952 when a guy who saw what others didn't in those canyons could dig a fortune right out of the rock.